In this video, we're going to talk about momentum. What is momentum? Momentum is basically mass in motion. If you have an object with mass and it's moving, that object has momentum. One person described it as the quantity of motion. Momentum, indicated by the symbol P, it's mass times velocity. Momentum, like velocity, is a vector. So it has magnitude and direction. For instance, let's say if we have a three kilogram ball and this ball, let's say it has a velocity of seven meters per second due east. What's the momentum of this object? The momentum is going to be 3 times 7. It's going to be positive 21 kilograms times meters per second. Now let's compare that with, let's say, a 5 kilogram ball. That is moving west at 4 meters per second. So its velocity will be negative 4. The momentum, which is mass times velocity, is going to be 5 times negative 4. So it's going to be negative 20 kilograms times meters per second. So as you can see, momentum is a vector just as velocity is a vector. So it can be positive if it's directed in the positive x direction or negative if it's going in the negative x direction. Momentum is positive going north and negative going south in the y direction. So direction is important when you're talking about momentum. Now, based on Newton's second law, we know that the net force acting on an object is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And going back to kinematics, you've seen this formula. The final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus at. If we subtract both sides by the initial velocity, we'll get this expression. And if we divide both sides by t, we'll get that the acceleration is v final minus v initial over t. So basically, the acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes. It's delta v over delta t. So in this equation, we can replace the acceleration with the change in velocity divided by the change in time. Now, if we multiply both sides by delta t, we'll get that the force multiplied by the time, or the change in time, is equal to the mass times the change in velocity. So this equation is associated with the impulse momentum theorem. On the left side, we have the impulse. The impulse, which I'm going to use the letter I. By the way, in physics, sometimes you'll see I as inertia. But for this video, if you see I, I'm using it to represent impulse. So F times delta T is impulse. M times delta V is the change in momentum. So according to the impulse momentum theorem, the impulse acting on an object is equal to that object's change in momentum. So this equation here, highlighted in red, will be used quite often in this video. So you want to make sure that you write it down. And remember, impulse is equal to force multiplied by time. Now, sometimes you might be dealing with a force that is not constant, that may change with time. So if you have a force time graph that looks something like this, just know that the area under the curve is equal to the impulse. So anytime you have a, a time variant force and you need to calculate the impulse, you just need to find the area under the curve. 
Now, for those of you who are taking physics with calculus, you need to know that the impulse is the integral of force with respect to time. So if you have the force function, or if you know the force as a function of time, you could use this formula to get the impulse. And the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So this definite integral, let's say if you integrate it from A to B, this will give you the change in momentum. So if you were to differentiate both sides of this expression, you'll find that the force is the derivative of the momentum function. So if you know the momentum function in terms of time, or if you have momentum as a function of time, it's better to say it that way, and you take the derivative of that function, then you're going to get the force function, or force as a function of time. Now let's go back to this equation, where we said that the net force is equal to m delta v over delta c. So we know that momentum is mass times velocity. The change in momentum is the mass times the change in velocity. So we can replace this part with delta p. So the net force acting on an object is equal to the rate at which the momentum of that object is changing. So that, that's what this equation tells you. The net force is equal to the rate of change of the momentum of that object, which is very is basically the same idea behind this equation. So the force is basically the derivative of the momentum function. Now let's talk about inelastic and elastic collisions. So let's make a table. So in this column, this is going to be if the collision is elastic, and here if it's inelastic, and sometimes you'll have collisions that are completely inelastic. So the first scenario we're going to talk about is momentum. For an elastic collision, momentum is conserved. What this means is that the total momentum of all of the objects in the system is going to be the same before the collision and after the collision. Now, during the collision, the momentum of the individual objects may change. One object may gain momentum, another object may lose momentum. But the total momentum, the sum of all of the all of the momenta of all the objects in that system is conserved, even though the individual momentum may change. For an inelastic collision, the total momentum before and after the collision is also conserved. So for any type of collision, whether it's inelastic or elastic, the total momentum, not the individual momentum, but the total momentum is conserved. Now let's talk about kinetic energy. What can we say about kinetic energy for these different types of collisions? For an elastic collision, the total kinetic energy is conserved. It's so not necessarily the individual kinetic energies of the objects in the system, but the, the total kinetic energy before the collision and after the collision remains the same. For an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. And this is true regardless of an inelastic collision or a collision that is completely inelastic. Now you might be wondering, what is the difference between a completely inelastic collision versus an inelastic collision? Since in both cases, Ke is not conserved. In an inelastic collision, 
you can either have a loss or a gain of kinetic energy. For a collision that is completely inelastic, you're going to have a loss of kinetic energy. In fact, you're going to have the maximum loss of kinetic energy. Now let's talk about some situations that would indicate what type of collision you're dealing with. So let's say if you have two balls that collide and they bounce off. If they bounce off each other, the collision may be elastic or it may be inelastic. It all depends on whether Ke is conserved or not. If Ke is conserved, it's elastic. If kinetic energy is not conserved, it's inelastic. Now, if the two objects, let's say if you have two blocks colliding with each other, if they stick together, then the collision is completely inelastic. During those situations, that's where you lose the maximum amount of kinetic energy. But in all cases, momentum is conserved. So the amount of kinetic energy that you lose depends on the conservation of momentum. In some situations, this can mean losing all of the kinetic energy. Let's say if you have two blocks of equal masses, but with the same magnitude of velocity, but if they're moving in opposite directions and they collide and stick together, well, the total momentum before such collision is zero and the total momentum after the collision will be zero. That means that they will come into a complete stop. And so they will lose all of their kinetic energy. In a situation like that, where momentum is still conserved, it's possible that in a completely inelastic collision, you could lose all of the kinetic energy. Not in all cases. In some cases, you could lose just a large amount and you still have some left over. In other cases, you could lose all of it. But this situation leads to the maximum loss of kinetic energy, whether it's most of it or all of it. Now let's write some equations that you're going to be using when solving math problems. So the first equation is going to be associated with the conservation of momentum. Momentum is always conserved for any type of collision. The total momentum of an isolated system of colliding objects remains constant. The system is isolated in that there are no external forces acting on the colliding objects. The only forces that are present are the internal forces that the colliding objects exert on each other. So let's say if you have ball A colliding with ball B. Ball A is going to exert a force on ball B when it collides with ball B. This is known as a contact force. Ball B will exert an equal but opposite reaction force in accordance with Newton's third law. So because these two forces, I mean these two objects, exert equal forces in the same period of time, the impulse exerted by each of these two objects are the same because they exert the same force within the same contact time. So they exert the same amount of impulse on each other. And we know that impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So when object A collides with object B, the magnitude of the change in momentum is the same. So let's say if object B was at rest, but object A was moving. So let's say initially object A had a momentum of 10 and initially object B had a momentum of zero. And let's say after the collision, object A lost four units of momentum. So now it's, it's down to six. Object B is going to gain those four units of momentum. So object A lost four units of momentum, object B gained four. So the magnitude of the change is the same. One lost four, one gained four. 
But note that the total momentum remains the same. The total momentum before the collision was 10. The total momentum after the collision is still 10. So momentum is conserved. Now the momentum of the individual objects, they can change. One object will gain momentum, the other one will lose it. But the change in momentum for both of them, the magnitude of that change is still the same. So remember, momentum is only conserved for an isolated system where the only forces acting on the colliding objects are the internal forces that result from the collisions of these objects. If there was an external force acting on one of these objects, that external force can either increase or decrease the momentum of the object, thus changing the total momentum of the system. So momentum is not conserved if an external force such as gravity or an electric force or an elastic force is acting on these objects. So for any collision, momentum is always conserved. The total momentum before the collision equals the total momentum after the collision. So let's say if we have two colliding objects object one and object two. So here's object one and here is object two. The momentum of object one, we'll call it P1. The initial momentum of object two, P2. The final momentum of object one, we'll call it P1 prime. And the final momentum of object two, P2 prime. So P1 is going to be M1 V1. P2 M2, V2. P1 prime will be M1, V1 prime. P2 prime is M2, V2 prime. So V1 is the velocity of object one before the collision. V1 prime is the velocity of object one after the collision. So the left side is associated with before the collision and the right side is associated with after the collision. So make sure to write down this equation because we're going to use it a lot in this video. So for inelastic collisions, this is going to be the main equation that we will be using. Now for elastic collisions, remember momentum is conserved and the total kinetic energy is conserved. So when dealing with an elastic collision, there are two formulas that you need to use. This is, this is going to be number one. Number two, sometimes you'll need to use it if you can't solve the problem using equation one by itself. Sometimes you have multiple missing variables. Let's say we have two missing variables. Then you need two equations to solve those two missing variables. And for elastic collisions, the second equation will be useful. It's V1 plus V1 prime, which equals V2 plus V2 prime. So this is the simplified equation. That is the result of combining this equation with the equation for the conservation of kinetic energy. That is where the total initial kinetic energy is equal to the total final kinetic energy. So for the two colliding objects that we mentioned earlier, it will be 1 half m1 v1 squared, that's the initial kinetic energy of object 1, plus 1 half m1 v2 squared, that's the initial kinetic energy of object 2, that equals, this should be a 2, m2 v2 squared. And this equals 1 half m1 v1 prime squared plus one half m2 v2 prime squared. So when you combine this equation and this one, you get this simplified equation. So remember, for inelastic collisions, for the most part, you'll be using just this equation. For elastic collisions, you can use this equation and this equation combined. 
If you only have one missing variable, this equation will suffice. If you have two missing variables, you need to use this equation and this one to solve it. Now let's work on some practice problems. Which object has a greater momentum? A 1200 kilogram car moving at a speed of 35 meters per second or a 3000 kilogram truck moving at a speed of 15 meters per second? Well, let's calculate the momentum of each. Let's start with the momentum of the car. It's a mass times velocity. The car has a mass of 1200 kilograms and it's moving at a speed of 35 meters per second. So this means that it has a momentum of 42,000 kilograms times meters per second. Now let's compare that with the momentum of the truck. The mass of the truck is 3,000 kilograms. The speed of the truck is 15 meters per second. So this is going to be 45,000 kilograms times meters per second. So we can clearly see that in this example, the truck has a greater momentum than the car. Number two, a three kilogram block is moving east at five meters per second. A seven kilogram block is moving west at six meters per second. And a five kilogram block is moving east at four meters per second. What is the total momentum of this system? So let's draw a picture. Here is our three kilogram block and it's directed east at five meters per second. And there's another block that has a mass of seven kilograms and it's heading west at six meters per second. And the third block is moving east at four meters per second and it has a mass of five kilograms. So the total momentum of this system is simply the momentum of, we'll call this block A, B, and C. So it's the sum of the individual momentums of each block. So we're going to have MA, VA, plus MB, VB, and then plus MC, VC. So the mass of the first block is three kilograms and it has a velocity of positive five. The second block has a mass of seven and it has a velocity of negative six since it's directed west. The third block has a mass of five and a velocity of positive four since it's going east. So three times five is 15, seven times negative six is negative 42, five times four is 20. 15 minus 42 plus 20, this is equal to negative seven kilograms times meters per second. So that's the answer for this problem. That's how you can calculate the total momentum of a system. You simply need to add up the individual momenta of all the objects in that system. Number three, a five kilogram block is moving east at six meters per second, and the six kilogram block is moving north at four meters per second. Find the magnitude and direction relative to the x-axis of the net momentum of the system. So let's begin with a picture. So here is the five kilogram block, and it's heading east at six meters per second. And we have another block, a six kilogram block. And this block is moving north 
at 4 meters per second. The momentum of the first block is 5 times 6, so it's positive 30 kilograms times meters per second. And it's in the x direction. Now for the other one, it's going to be a mass of 6 times a velocity of 4, but this momentum is in the y direction. And it has a value of positive 24 since it's going in a positive y direction. So momentum is a vector. The net momentum has an x component of 30 and it has a y component of 24. So the resultant vector will be heading towards quadrant 1 in an xy coordinate system. And here's the direction angle. So the net momentum will be the square root of px squared plus py squared. We need to use the hypotenuse, I mean, we need to use the Pythagorean theorem to find the value of this hypotenuse. So it's the square root of 30 squared plus 24 squared. So the magnitude of the net momentum vector is approximately 38.4 kilograms times meters per second. Now let's calculate the angle. The angle is going to be arc tangent, the y component over the x component. So arc tangent py over px. So that's going to be arc tan 24 over 30. And that gives us an angle of approximately 38.7 degrees. So now we know the magnitude and we know the direction relative to the x axis of the net momentum of the system. Number four, a force of 200 newtons acts on an object for three seconds. What is the value of the impulse acting on this object? Impulse is force multiplied by time. So we have a force of 200 newtons acting on an object for three seconds. So that gives us an impulse of 600 newtons times seconds. Part B, calculate the change in the momentum of this object. The impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So an impulse of 600 newtons times seconds, and this is positive, this correlates to an increase in momentum. So the, the momentum is going to increase by 600 kilograms times meters per second. So take note of the units. Impulse is typically represented in units of newtons times seconds, momentum kilograms times meters per second. And these units, they have the same value. One kilogram times one meter per second is equal to one newton times one second. So be mindful of that. Number five. A force of 300 newtons due east acts on a 60 kilogram block for four seconds. And the block was initially moving east at 10 meters per second. Calculate the impulse exerted on the block. So let's begin with a picture. So let's say this is the 60 kilogram block. And we have a force of 300 newtons acting on this block. And the block was initially moving with a speed of 10 meters per second. And this force acts on the block for a time period of four seconds. So what is the impulse? Impulse is force multiplied by time. 
So we have a force of 300 newtons acting on the block for a period of 4 seconds. 3 times 4 is 12, add the two zeros. So the impulse is 1200 newtons times seconds. Part B, determine the change in momentum. The change in momentum is equal to the impulse. So that's going to be positive 1200 kilograms times meters per second. So keep in mind, momentum is not conserved when an external force is acting on an object. Here we have an external force accelerating this 60 kilogram block. And so this force is increasing the momentum of this block. Part C, calculate the final momentum of the block. Well, first we need to know its initial momentum, which is mass times velocity. So we have a 60 kilogram block moving at a speed of 10 meters per second. So the initial momentum is 60 times 10 or 600 kilograms times meters per second. Now the change in momentum is the difference between the final and the initial momentum. So to calculate the final momentum, we need to add the initial momentum to both sides of the equation. Therefore, the final momentum is basically the initial momentum plus the change in momentum. The initial momentum was 600. We have a change of 1200. So the force is adding 1200 units of momentum to this block. And so the final momentum will be 1800 kilograms times meters per second. So that's the answer. That's the final momentum of the block four seconds later. Now the last thing we need to do in part D is calculate the final speed of the block. So now that we know the final momentum and it's equal to the mass times the final velocity, we can replace the final momentum with 1800 the mass is 60 kilograms, and we can calculate VF. So we just got to divide both sides by 60. 1800 divided by 60, we can cancel a zero, and it's 180 divided by six, which is 30. So that's gonna be the final speed of the block. It's 30 meters per second. So that's it for this problem. Number six, an unknown force accelerates an eight kilogram block from rest to 15 meters per second in four seconds. Calculate the change in momentum of the block. Now we can draw a picture, which will be very similar to the previous picture. But this time our goal is to calculate the average force. So initially, the block was at rest. But after a time period of four seconds, the speed will change from zero to 15 meters per second. So to calculate the change in momentum, that's gonna be the mass times the change in velocity. So the block has a mass of eight kilograms and delta V, we can replace that with V final minus V initial. So let's replace M with eight kilograms. V final is 15 meters per second. V initial accelerated from rest, so that's zero. So this is just eight times 15. So the change in momentum is 120 kilograms times meters per second. that's the answer for part A. And keep in mind, the change in momentum is equal to the impulse. And that's going to help us to calculate the magnitude of the average force acting on the block. The impulse is equal to the average force times the time at which that force is acting upon the block. So we can replace the impulse with 120 newtons per second. And we can replace delta T with four seconds. So let's divide both sides by four seconds. So here we can see the unit seconds will cancel, giving us 
the unit of force, which is in newtons. So it's 120 divided by 4. Thus, the average force is going to be 30 newtons. That's the answer for part B. That's the average force acting on the block. Number seven, a golf club exerted an average force of 1500 newtons while it struck a 50 gram golf ball from rest to a final speed of 40 meters per second. How long was the ball in contact with the golf club? So we need to calculate the contact time. For a problem like this, where you need to calculate the average force or the contact time, you could use the impulse momentum theorem equation. So the impulse, which is force multiplied by the contact time, that's equal to the change in momentum, which is mass times the change in velocity. And the change in velocity, delta V, you could replace that with V final minus V initial. So the average force is 1500 newtons. Our goal is to calculate delta T. Now we have a 50 gram ball and we need to convert that to kilograms. To convert grams to kilograms, simply divide by 1,000. 50 divided by 1,000 is 0 0.05. So that's the mass in kilograms. The final speed is 40 meters per second. The initial speed, the golf ball was initially at rest, so that's a zero. So we have 1500 times delta T, and that's going to equal 0 0.05 times 40, which is 2. So to get delta T by itself, we need to divide both sides by 1500. Two divided by 1500, that gives us a contact time of 0 0.0013 repeating seconds. If we multiply this by 1,000, we can convert seconds into milliseconds. So this is 1.3 repeating milliseconds. So that's how long the golf ball was in contact with the golf club for approximately 1.3 milliseconds. Number eight, a 300 gram ball is traveling west at 20 meters per second when it is struck horizontally by a baseball bat causing it to travel east at 50 meters per second. So let's draw a picture. So let's say this is the baseball bat. And we have a ball. traveling towards his baseball bat at a speed of 20 meters per second. And then after it's struck by the bat, it's going to go in the opposite direction. It's traveling east at 50 meters per second. So that's what's happening here. In order for the ball to change direction, the bat has to exert a very large force in a very small amount of time to greatly change the momentum of this object. So let's calculate that large average force that the bat exerted on the ball. So once again, we could use the impulse momentum theorem. F delta T is equal to M times the change in V. So this time, our goal is to calculate F. We want to calculate if the bat was in contact with the ball for 20 milliseconds, what average force did the bat exert on the ball? So delta T is 20 milliseconds, but we need that in seconds. To convert milliseconds into seconds, divide by 1,000. 20 milliseconds divided by 1,000 is 0 0.02 seconds. The mass is in grams, so we need to divide that by 1,000 to convert it to kilograms. 300 divided by 1,000 is 0.3. So that's the mass of the ball. It's 0.3 kilograms. Now, what is the initial and final velocity? The initial velocity, 
it's due west, so this is going to be negative 20. The final velocity, Vf, it's due east, so that's going to be positive 50. So we have positive 50 minus negative 20. So be careful with this problem because there's two negatives. So the change in velocity is 50 plus 20, which is 70. So on the right, we have 0.3 times 70, which is 21. And then on the left, we have this. So to get F, we need to divide both sides by 0 0.025. So the average force, oh, I take that back. That is not 0 0.025. This is an S. So that's the unit seconds. I just mixed up my S with a five. So it's 21 divided by 0 0.02. And so that gives us an average force of 1050 newtons. So that's the answer for part A. Now let's move on to part B. Calculate the impulse exerted on the ball. The impulse is force multiplied by time. So we have an average force of 1050 newtons, and that force was active for a time period of 0 0.02 seconds. So 1050 times 0 0.02, that's going to be 21. So the impulse is 21 newtons times seconds. And in part C, what is the change in the momentum of the ball? The change in momentum is mass times the change in velocity. So we have a mass of 0.3 kilograms, and the change in velocity going from negative 20 to positive 50, that's a change of 70 meters per second. And so this is going to be, let's see if I could fit it here, 0.3 times 70, we know that's 21 kilograms times meters per second. So that's the change in the momentum of the object, which is equal to the impulse imparted by the object, or the impulse imparted on the object, I should say. Number nine, a car with mass m is moving with a speed v. If the mass of the car is doubled and its speed is tripled, by what factor will the magnitude of its momentum increase? Well, we know that momentum is mass times velocity. The mass is increasing by a factor of two. The velocity is increasing by a factor of three. So two times three is six. Therefore, the momentum will increase by a factor of six. So D is the correct answer. Number 10. A four kilogram object moving east at five meters per second experiences a force as depicted by the graph shown below. Calculate the impulse imparted to the block. So on the right, we have a force time graph. The impulse is the area under the curve. So we need to calculate the area under the curve. What we're going to do is break it up into a triangle and a rectangle. So let's calculate the area of the triangle first. The area of a triangle is one half base times height. So the base of the triangle, we could see it's two. The height of the triangle is 20. Half of two is one times 20. This gives us an area of 20. Now to find the area of the rectangle, we have a width of three, that's five minus two and we have a height of 20. So area is left times width, so the area is 60. The total area going from zero to five or during the first five seconds is 20 plus 60. So the impulse is gonna be 80 
with the units newtons times seconds. So that is the impulse imparted to this object. Now the fact that it's positive tells us that it's going to accelerate the object. So we have a four kilogram object that's moving east at five meters per second. In order to impart a positive impulse on this object, we need to apply a force in the direction of the velocity of this object in order to accelerate it. So now to calculate the final velocity, we can start with this equation. F delta T is equal to M delta V. Now, we've already calculated this part of the equation by finding the area under the curve. That's force multiplied by time. So the left side is the impulse. The right side is the change in momentum. The change in velocity, we can write that as V final minus V initial. So we have an impulse of positive 80. The mass is 4 kilograms. Our goal is to calculate the final velocity. The initial velocity is 5 meters per second east. So we can replace it V initial with 5. So first, let's divide 80 by 4. 80 divided by 4 is 20. So 20 is equal to VF minus 5. Add in 5 to both sides, we can see that the final velocity is 25. The fact that it's positive tells us that it's still going east. It accelerated in an eastward direction. So the answer to part B, we could say that the magnitude of the velocity is 25 meters per second and its direction is east. So remember, velocity is speed with direction. If this problem simply wanted the speed, we would just say it's 25 meters per second. But since it asks for the velocity, we need to mention the speed and the direction. So it's 25 meters per second due east. Number 11, a five kilogram block moving east at six meters per second experiences a force as depicted by the graph shown below. Calculate the change in the momentum of the block. So remember, the impulse is equal to the change in the momentum of the block. If we can calculate the impulse, we can calculate the change in momentum. So we got to find the area under the curve again. So here we have a triangle. The base of the triangle is 2. The height is, is 30. So 2 times 30 is 60, and half of that is going to be 30. Now this is above the x-axis, so this is positive 30. This part is below the x-axis. It's going to be negative. So the base of this triangle is 4 minus 2, which is 2. The height is 40, or negative 40. So 2 times a negative 40, that's a negative 80. Half of that, this is going to be negative 40. For the rectangle, it's going to be left times width. The length is 8 minus 4, which is 4, times negative 40. So this is going to be negative 160. Now, if we add 30 and negative 40, that's negative 10. And then if we add negative 10 to negative 160, we get an impulse, which is the change in momentum of negative 170. And since we're looking for the change in momentum, we're going to use the units kilograms times meters per second instead of newtons times seconds, even though they're equivalent. Now for part B, we want to calculate the final velocity of the block. So the change in momentum, which is the impulse, that's equal to m delta v. And delta V is V final minus V initial. So the change in momentum is negative 170. We have a 5 kilogram block that is traveling due east with an initial speed of 6 meters per second. So since the impulse is negative, the force that's acting on this block is directed due west. It's opposed in the motion. It's slowing it down. Our goal is to calculate V final. V initial is just 6. So if we divide both sides by 5, we're going to have negative 170 divided by 5, which is negative 34. And that's equal to V final minus 6. 
So if we add 6 to both sides, we get that V final is negative 34 plus 6, or negative 28 meters per second. So we could say that the final velocity has a magnitude of 28 meters per second. And due to the negative sign, we know that the direction is due west. This force was strong enough to not only slow down the block to rest, but to accelerate it in the other direction. So that's the velocity, 28 meters per second due west. Number 12. Which of the following statements is false? So let's look at the first statement. The impulse imparted to an object is equal to the object's change in momentum. Is that true or false? Well, we know that's a true statement. Throughout this video, we've been stating that impulse is equal to the change in momentum. Impulse is force multiplied by time. The change in momentum is mass times the change in velocity. So those two are always equal to each other, according to the impulse momentum theorem. Part B, momentum has the same dimensions as impulse. And that is true because they're equal to each other. Momentum has the units kilograms times meters per second, which is equivalent to the units of impulse, which is newtons times seconds. So B is the true statement. Thus, we could eliminate answer choices A and B as answers. Now what about C? A small force applied over a long period of time can produce a large change in an object's momentum. Well, if we go back to the example where we had the bat, the baseball bat, and it struck the ball, changing its direction, accelerating it towards the right, this baseball bat applies a large force over a small period of time. And so you have these two ways in which you can exert a, a huge change in, a, in the object's momentum. You can apply a large force over a small period of time, or you can apply a small force over a large period of time and still be able to affect the same change or even greater in the object's momentum. So for an object to experience a large change in its momentum, you can apply a large force over a small period of time. You can also apply a large force over a long period of time, which won't be easy to do. And you can also apply a small force over a long period of time. So C is definitely a true statement. If you apply a small force in a small period of time or a short period of time, it's not going to change the object's momentum. But if you apply a small force over a long period of time, it's probably better to say long instead of large. You know, this is another way in which you can greatly change an object's momentum. Now, what about statement D? The momentum of an object is always conserved during a two-body collision. Is that true or false? This is a false statement. Now, why is that? Imagine a situation where you have a block at rest and you have a ball that is moving towards the block at rest. And let's say the surface is frictionless. And let's say the initial momentum of the ball is 100. The initial momentum of the block is 0. Now during collision, when the ball collides with the block, these two will exert forces on each other. These forces will be equal and opposite in magnitude. And since these forces are acting during the same time period, the impulse that is exerted on each other will be the same. And therefore, the change of momentum acting on these two objects, or that occurs in these two objects during that same time period will be the same. 
So this ball might lose 30 units of momentum, which means the final momentum might be 70. This one is going to gain the amount of momentum that was lost by the other object. So this is going to gain 30. So the final momentum will be 30. So looking at this example, we could see that the momentum of an object was not conserved. Initially, this ball had a momentum of 100, but when it strikes the block, it's going to slow down. Its speed will be reduced. Therefore, its momentum was reduced. So the momentum of just that object was not conserved. So that's why D is a false statement. Now the total momentum is conserved. If we add up these two, we get 100. And if we add up the final momentum of both objects, we still get 100. So the total momentum of two bodies colliding with each other, that's going to be conserved as long as there's only internal forces acting on those objects. And not only that, but the change in momentum, that is the magnitude of the change of the momentum is the same. One object loses momentum, the other object gains momentum. But the magnitude of that change is the same, even though one is positive and the other is negative. So D is the answer to this problem, but let's consider answer choice E for the sake of learning. The total momentum of a system of two colliding objects will never be conserved during free fall. Now, in order for D to be the answer, we know that this has to be a true statement. But why is it true? Well, let's consider a situation. So let's say we have these two cliffs, which are at the same height. And there is an object with the same mass on these two cliffs. And let's say initially, both objects are traveling in a horizontal direction with the same speed. Object one will follow this trajectory and object two will follow this trajectory as well. Eventually, if their horizontal speed is enough, these two will collide as they fall. Now, let's talk about why their momentum is not conserved. Remember, the momentum of an isolated system, the total momentum of an isolated system, is conserved because in an isolated system, you only have internal forces acting on the objects. And this internal force is just the forces that are generated when these two objects collide. However, in this scenario, this is not an isolated system. We do have an external force. And that external force is the force of gravity which changes the momentum of both objects. Initially, this object had a momentum only in the x direction, both objects one and two. And gravity, it doesn't affect an object's horizontal velocity. Therefore, gravity doesn't affect, it doesn't affect the x component of the momentum of these objects. So the momentum in the x direction is conserved for this particular situation. However, gravity accelerates the objects in the negative y direction. Gravity changes the vertical velocity of, the, of these objects. And so now, gravity has imparted a y component to the momentum. So the net momentum, let's say, of object 1 is the square root of px squared plus py squared. Initially, py was 0. So when you simplify this equation, you get that p initial is equal to px. But after some time t, the final momentum is not just equal to px. It's going to be the square root of px squared plus py squared. So px was constant, but since gravity added py to the equation, the magnitude of the momentum of each object has increased. Because not only is there an x component, but there's now a y component. So by adding py squared to this equation, pf is going to be greater than p initial. So gravity has increased the overall momentum of each of these two colliding objects by giving it a y component.
So because we have this external force, we no longer have an isolated system. Therefore, the total momentum of this system of two colliding objects is not conserved during free fall. Gravity increases the magnitude of the momentum of each of these objects, thus increasing the total momentum of the system.